I appreciate you joining us for this time of Bible study, and I pray that our time together in God's Word will prove to be a real help to you in your spiritual growth. Uh, let me encourage you to contact me if you ever have any questions or comments about our study time together. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can email me or call the church office or just write me a letter. Uh, the information as to how you can contact me will be given at the end of the broadcast. And let me also encourage you to come out and visit us at Hope Bible Church in Locust Grove. We're located on Tanger Boulevard. Directions to our church property, service times, uh, the information concerning our statement of faith and ministries, all of that is on our website, hopebiblechurchga.com. And I'd like for you to uh, think about going on our website and checking out the information there because not only information about our church, but also uh, there's a lot of Bible study material available to you there, uh, video messages, audio messages, and written material. In fact, uh, Bible study time, is we, we have a, a, an order to our lessons. This is our 15th lesson and uh, there's an order to what we're doing, so if you'd like to go back, if you missed any of the previous lessons, those are archived uh, on our YouTube channel. If you click on resources on our website and then click on video, it'll take you to the YouTube channel. You'll see uh, Bible study time messages as well as messages uh, from our church services here at Hope Bible Church. Also, we have charts available. If you'd like a copy of the study chart you see behind me, uh, we'd be happy to put one of these in the mail to you. Just let us know your address. You can email. You can call the church and uh, let us know you'd like a copy, and we'll be happy to uh, send one to you. Here locally, uh, it's pretty cheap, really. It uh, don't cost much at all uh, to put one of these in the mail. I was surprised that we were able to send uh, some of these charts to Ireland and Canada, for an example, for uh, pretty cheap. So even if you're watching this on YouTube internationally, we'd be happy uh, to send one to you, wherever you might be. Now, we are systematically going through uh, keys to Bible study uh, so that you might better learn how to study the Bible for yourself. This program is not about me just teaching you the Bible, but it's about uh, us looking at the Word of God together and equipping you with the understanding of how to study the Bible so that you can study it on your own. It's good to have teachers to help us, uh, but we personally need to study the Word of God for ourselves. And the first key is you must be saved, because if you're not saved, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. There's no way you're going to understand the spiritual truth of the Word of God without the Spirit of God. So first of all, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. The gospel by which we're saved in this present age of grace is, is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1-4, through 4, as being how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that's it. Anybody tries to add anything to that? They're preaching a false gospel. They've perverted the gospel of Christ, Paul said in Galatians 1. When you add works that you can do, uh, there's a lot of people out there They say, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, but there's more to it than that. You've got to be baptized. You've got to join a church. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to endure to the end. And uh, when they add those works, they have perverted the gospel of grace. The gospel of the grace of God is that salvation is a free gift purchased in full by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, all you must do is receive the gift by faith. The Bible said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what Paul said in Acts 16 to an individual who asked him, What must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, Repent and be baptized. That's what Peter said in Acts 2 to the nation Israel. That's not what Paul said to us in this age of grace. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When you believe on Christ, the Spirit of God is in you. He'll give you spiritual understanding, illumination to the Word of God as you study the Word of God. And so the second key is you've got to be a Bible believer. God's not going to give spiritual understanding to somebody that doesn't believe His Word. You've got to, number one, know the Lord, and then number two, believe His book. So you've got to have a heart preparation for Bible study. Bible study is not some dry academic pursuit where the so-called theologians like to sit around uh, and, uh, and talk about all kind of theories and speculations about what they think about. We don't care what people think about the Bible. We want to know what God says in His Word, and you've got to have a heart that believes His Word, and, and you study the Bible because you love God and you want to grow in your knowledge of Him and His plan and purpose for the ages. It's about a relationship. It's not about religion at all. And you can have communion with God through the Word of God. The only place God's going to speak to you today is through His Word. If you want to know what God has to say to you, you've got to read His Word and believe what He says. The Bible said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And faith is absolutely essential for without faith, it says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, it's impossible to please Him. 
And so you got to be saved. You got to believe the book. And as you do that, you you then follow what God said in Second Timothy two fifteen. This is the major key because. You might be saved and believe the Bible, but if you don't follow 2 Timothy 2.15, you're not going to understand the Bible like God wants you to. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's what the word of God says. And the only verse in the Bible where it plainly says to study the word of truth that tells you how to do it, you rightly divide it. Uh, that's the God-given key to Bible study. And so all scriptures for us, 2 Timothy 3.16 said all scripture is profitable. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's all for us, but it's not all written to us. It's not, not all written about us. And it's going to become unprofitable if we don't rightly divide the word of truth. See, before Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, he said that in 2 Timothy 3.16. Before he said that, by inspiration of God, he said rightly divide the word of truth. That's chapter 2, verse 15. So we have been talking about rightly dividing the word of truth, and uh, we, we've shown you some basics about what that means. Uh, we've talked about the main division in the word of God. And again, right division is not an issue of dividing truth from error. All the Bible is the truth. The Bible said rightly dividing the word of truth. It's acknowledging the divisions that are in the word of God itself. Now, obviously, we, as we learn the word of God, we'll discern truth from error. But right division is in the book itself, in the word of truth itself, there are divisions, and you've got to recognize those and maintain those in your understanding as you study the word of God. So we've talked about the main division being that which uh, the difference between that which was spoken by the prophets since the world began. That's what Peter said in Acts 3, verse 21. And that which was kept secret since the world began till it was revealed to Paul. That's Romans 16, 25. That is the main division in the Word of God. And from there we talked about the twofold purpose, God's purpose concerning the heaven and concerning the earth. His purpose concerning the heaven was a mystery. It's got to do with the body of Christ. That was revealed to Paul. It was planned before the world began, but it was kept secret until it was revealed to Paul. His, plan, his purpose for the earth concerns Israel and the kingdom to be established on the earth. And so we, we, we looked at the main division. We looked at the twofold purpose. And then last time we gave you an example of rightly dividing the word of truth from Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul shows us how to rightly divide the word of truth. If you want to look in Ephesians 2 once again, we'll start there. Uh, we're not going to go over the material we covered last time, but we'll start here again. Ephesians 2 verse number 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Now we showed you how in time past there was this distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. And the Gentiles could only be blessed by coming through Israel. Uh, they had to be a blessing to the seed of Abraham in order to be blessed by God. Uh, that's what God said to Abraham and his promise to him in Genesis 12, 3. I'll bless them that bless thee, I'll curse him that curseth thee. And so we talked about that time past, and that's from Abraham uh, in Genesis 12 all the way through the early chapters of Acts. But now is the next, the next um, thing we want to look at. Look at verse 13. But now. So in contrast with time past, but now, as in this present age, uh, as a result of the revelation God gave the Apostle Paul. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Uh, so this but now period, the, it couldn't have been before the cross because what happens but now is based on the cross. He said, By the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For by, uh, through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. By the way, verse 18 is a great verse on the Trinity. Through him, Christ... We both, both believing Jews and Gentiles, we both have access by one Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit under the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, God uh, the Father, right there in, the, in verse 18 of Ephesians 2. So, but now, 
There's no more distinction. Whether you're Jew or Gentile doesn't matter. The Bible said in Galatians 3 that in the body of Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. As far as spiritually speaking, we're all one, have the same spiritual standing. And we didn't get this through Israel. Israel fell in Acts chapter 7. We talked about that last time. Uh, this is on the basis of the cross, but it wasn't revealed until Paul. You know, there's a lot that Christ accomplished on his cross that wasn't revealed right away. Uh, Satan, for an example, uh, was defeated through the cross of Christ, and yet he, he hasn't been fully executed yet. Uh, Romans 16.20 says that God will bruise sa Satan under our feet shortly. In other words, future tense. But he was defeated through the cross. But everything Christ accomplished was not carried out immediately. And not everything Christ accomplished was revealed immediately. See, we get in the body of Christ by believing the gospel that Christ revealed through Paul. Paul said he got the gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ. He wasn't taught it. He didn't receive it of man. That's Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12. He got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. And the gospel by which we're saved is the gospel, the grace of God, as Paul calls it in Acts 20, verse 24. That's the only gospel to be preached in this present age of grace. And whether you're a Jew or Gentile, when you believe that gospel, you're baptized into one body, spiritually baptized into one spiritual body, so there's no more distinction but now. Okay, and we're a heavenly people with a heavenly position. Israel was an earthly people with a, an earthly position. And so that, that's a major difference. But then in verse 7 of Ephesians 2, he said that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So Paul refers to time past, but now and ages to come. And uh, that's a clear example of rightly dividing the word of truth. In time past, there was that distinction between Jew and Gentile. But now we're one new man, one spiritual body. In the ages to come, there will be that distinction again because the body of Christ is destined to reign in heavenly places eternally. Ephesians 2, 6 says, "...hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ." 2 Corinthians 5, 1, Paul said that God's going to give us a new glorified body that's eternal in the heavens. We're His heavenly people. And uh, so in ages to come, it, uh, the body of Christ is going to rule and reign in heavenly places, but Israel's going to get her kingdom on the earth just like God promised. And Israel will reign over the nations of the world, Christ on the throne of David in Jerusalem, Israel being a kingdom of priests, the Gentile nations coming to God through Israel, there will be that distinction again. That's the ages to come. Okay, So there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot of details we'll have to get into as we go along in our Bible studies. We can't possibly cover it all in one lesson. But just if you'll get that basic distinction down between time past, but now, and ages to come, it'll help you immensely. Now, what I want to talk about today... And it's a funny thing, my nose wasn't itching at all until we started recording this. Now, I, can't, I apologize, I have to keep scratching my nose like that. I don't know what it is about knowing you're, on, you're being recorded that all of a sudden your nose wants to itch. But at any rate, today we're going to talk about rightly dividing the books of the Bible. You know, the Bible is not laid out chronologically. Uh, God put the books of the Bible in a dispensational order. There's a dispensational layout to the books of the Bible. First of all, very simply, you have the threefold division we just talked about. Time passed, but now, ages to come. Well, Genesis through the book of Acts would be time passed. And when you see that distinction between Israel and the Gentiles. But now, the only place you're going to read about the body of Christ is in Romans through Philemon. Thirteen books written by the Apostle Paul to us in this age. And then the ages to come, that's what Hebrews through Revelation deals with. So you have a very simple outline. Time passed, Genesis through Acts, uh, the early part of Acts, but now Romans through Philemon, and ages to come is Hebrews through Revelation. But I want to give you some more specifics about the Bible as a whole. Uh, kind of just do an overview of, 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 the, of the Bible on, on this study today. You know, the Bible is one book made up of many different books. It is one book, but it's 66 books. It's 66 books in one. So it has unity and diversity, just like its author. God is one God, but He exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
God used about 40 different writers from various backgrounds and in different locations over a period of about 1,400 years, 1,500 years. God used these different writers to write the 66 books of the Bible. And these books cover 7,000 years of human history, and they give us glimpses both into eternity past and future. And the Bible is not everything that God knows, obviously, because God is all-knowing. It's not everything God knows, but it's everything God wants us to know about Him and His plan and purpose for the ages. And so we need to understand that the revelation um, of the Bible, and the Bible's closed. God's not going to add any more books to it. It's Genesis through Revelation, 66 books. But those books were given progressively. He didn't reveal everything at once. And it's an amazing thing to think about that the 66 books make up one book without error, without contradiction. That proves it's given by inspiration of God. Man could not have produced the Bible. No way. God used men to write it. He used men to preserve it. But the book is of God. It's God's Word. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. There are 31,101 verses. There are 791,328 words in the King James Bible. And not only did God inspire and preserve His Word so that we have a perfect copy of it today in our own language, He led men in the proper arrangement of its books, as well as the chapter and verse division, so that the Bible is laid out in a divine order perfectly designed for our edification. The chapter and verse divisions greatly enhance our ability to search the Scriptures. And with the invention of computers, searching the Scriptures is a lot easier than it's ever been. And yet, sadly, it's more neglected probably than it's ever been. People don't study the Bible like they should anymore. Uh, it's so easy to search the Scriptures with an iPad or a computer program. Now, I like to have an actual Bible in my hand, but I do use computer search programs. I mean, you can type in a word and it'll bring up all the verse that that, in which that word appears. Can you imagine in the past uh, having the different books in scrolls and having to unroll the scroll and look for the verse when there were no chapter divisions, there were no verse divisions? I mean, it would be very difficult to search the Scriptures. So we've got it easy, and we ought, we ought to search the Scriptures. Now, the Bible's a big book. It's an inexhaustible gold mine of divine revelation. Uh, we could spend a lifetime studying it in detail and never learn it all, but we should seek to learn as much as we can because it's the Word of God. And the purpose of learning the Bible is not just knowledge, it's the knowledge of God. The Bible is God's perfect revelation of Himself to man. And so as we approach the Bible, it's important in Bible study to have a basic overview of the Bible in our heart and mind because that will greatly help us in studying its details. Sometimes we can't see the forest because of the trees. So it's best to start with a panoramic view of the whole Bible before we examine its books, its chapters, its verses, its words. And a key to Bible study is to understand the larger context. In other words, a verse must be studied in light of the surrounding passage, the passage in light of the chapter, the chapter in light of the book, the book in light of the Testament, and the Testament in light of the whole Bible. So there's a unity of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There's a unity in the Bible. It reveals one God. It reveals one main purpose, the glory of God. It reveals one main theme, and that is the person and work of Jesus Christ. It reveals one main goal, and that's the establishment of God's kingdom, both in heaven and earth. It reveals one plan of redemption, the blood of Christ. Without the blood of Christ, there is no redemption. It reveals one set of moral principles. God's moral principles never change through the ages. It reveals one main enemy. We, we learn about Satan. Uh, it reveals, the Bible's all about God revealing himself, but he also tells us about our, our chief uh, enemy, the devil. And it reveals a harmonious unfolding of progressive revelation. Although it's one book, there are changes in God's dealings with men as He reveals things. No contradictions, just changes, and we learn to rightly divide the Word of Truth. There's a unity of the Bible. We need the whole book. But there are divisions that must be acknowledged and maintained. Again, 2 Timothy 2.15 said, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. It's failure to acknowledge the divisions that God put in His Word. That's the root cause of all manner of heresies. 
Now, the most obvious division is between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 of the New, but it's not correct, and we've taught uh, on this before on Bible study time, it's not correct to say that the whole Old Testament was the law for the Jews and the whole New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, is, is grace for this age and so on. And uh, that's not the main division because, uh, as we've pointed out, there couldn't have even been a New Testament uh, before the, the cross. There had to be the blood of Christ shed for the New Testament according to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. And so we understand that uh, Matthew through John about the earthly ministry of Christ, his earthly ministry was to Israel. Acts being a transition book from Israel to the body of Christ. But Hebrews to Revelation, again, the emphasis is on Israel. That's why the first book in that section is Hebrews. Uh, and we're not Hebrews. And James wrote to 12 tribes scattered abroad. No, Romans through Philemon was written directly to the body of Christ. That's the mystery. So the main division is between the mystery uh, revealed to Paul and the prophetic program concerning Israel and the nations and the earth and so on. And so we've shown you already that main division between prophecy and mystery. And we understand that the burden and emphasis of the prophecy spoken to Israel is the king and his kingdom. Prophecy concerns that which was spoken since the world began through uh, the prophets. And the burden emphasis of the mystery revealed through the Apostle Paul is the spiritual organism, the body of Christ. And the mystery concerns that which was kept secret since the world began. And so the things that were spoken by the prophets since the world began can't be the things that was kept secret since the world began. So we have this basic distinction. Prophecy concerns the earth. It's always from the foundation of the world. It's Christ the King, Israel over the Gentiles. Mystery concerns heaven. It's spoken of that which God planned before the foundation of the world. Christ is the head of one body. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. That's the division we need to acknowledge, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now with all that being said, you look at the books of the Bible and you see a clear outline. And uh, I gave you a threefold outline. Now let me give you a six point outline of the, bu the books of the Bible. Look how they're laid out. The Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, that is the king and his kingdom promised and prophesied. Okay, that's, that's the emphasis all the way through. The Gospels, number two, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospel records. That is the king and his kingdom presented but rejected. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then the book of Acts is the king and his kingdom reoffered to Israel and yet rejected. Three strikes and you're out. They rejected the Father in the Old Testament. They rejected the Son in the Gospels. When, we, when they rejected the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, that's when Israel fell as a nation. The transition began away from Israel to the body of Christ. Then you come to Paul's epistles. Romans through Philemon, 13 books. And in Paul's epistles, the king and his kingdom, the kingdom has been postponed. The king is now the head of one body, the body of Christ, the church. And so that's been revealed in Paul's epistles. But then in Hebrews through Revelation, the Hebrew epistles, uh, the king and his kingdom, well, it's resumed. And it's at hand once again. And then you come to the book of Revelation and the king establishes his kingdom on the earth. So the Bible is about the king and his kingdom. Now God's an eternal king. He's always had a kingdom ruling and reigning in the larger aspect of the kingdom of God. You have that angelic realm. You have a, a vast universe. But concerning mankind, concerning this earth, uh, the kingdom of heaven that we read about in the book of Matthew is when the God of heaven establishes his kingdom on the earth. All right, and now the, the bulk of the Bible deals with that. So you have the king and his kingdom promise and prophesied, Genesis through Malachi. You have the king and his kingdom presented and rejected in Matthew through John. Then the book of Acts, you have the kingdom reoffered and rejected again, then the transition away. Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon, uh, the kingdom's been postponed. Uh, Christ is the head of one body. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. This is a heavenly purpose. 
that age ends with the, this present age ends with the rapture, uh, the the rapture of the body of Christ up to heaven. God's going to resume His dealings with Israel, and we read about that in Hebrews through Revelation. Hebrews, I should say, Hebrews through Jude, those Hebrew epistles, and then lastly the book of Revelation, uh, that great prophetic book, the kingdom is established. Now that is a simple outline. It shows you the dispensational layout of the books of the Bible. We have a couple minutes left. Let me encourage you to turn to Hebrews and uh, let's look at something real quick. And a lot of people think, you know, Hebrews through Revelation is just like Romans through Philemon. It's all the same, but it's not. Paul wrote to the Gentiles. He said, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. He said that in Romans 11. But in Hebrews, you're dealing with Hebrews. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. And people say, well, Paul wrote Hebrews. Well, there's no evidence to that. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to say he didn't write Hebrews. Uh, Paul said the token of every epistle he wrote, 2 Thessalonians 3.17, uh, was his salutation. Paul's name is the first word in every epistle he wrote. That's Romans through Philemon. You come to Hebrews chapter 1. God, verse 1, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Talking about the Hebrew fathers. Talking about that which was spoken by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken us by his son. Uh, and Christ in his earthly ministry was confirming the promises made to the fathers. What is Hebrews about? Look in chapter 2, verse number 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? So in Hebrews to Revelation, it's based on the earthly ministry of Christ, what he was preaching concerning the kingdom of heaven. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders. Signs and wonders have to do with the kingdom. And with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. The world to come. That's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. And that's what Hebrews is dealing with. Hebrews is a transition just like Acts. Acts is a transition from Israel to the body of Christ. Hebrews is a transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, from the tribulation to the, to the kingdom age. And then in James 1, verse 1, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. So in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're not in twelve tribes. So we know James is not writing to the body of Christ. So it's very clear the distinction between Paul's epistles and the Hebrew epistles. So that's an overview of the dispensational layout of the books of the Bible. I think from this point on in our Bible study, we're going to get into some more details. We've given you some basics, some foundational things about right division. Now we're going to, be, we're going to begin to get more specific with things. I hope you'll join us in our studies to come. Thank you for joining us today.